You wanted battleships, you got battleships. The hardest working battleships in show business. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, today on 7th on History. You could say there's a bit of a battleship craze going on with Sabaton and Sabaton fans. I mean, Dreadnought, Bismarck, songs where you can really feel the unstoppable force of thousands of tons of steel cutting through the waves of the oceans. You love them. But Sabaton fans are not alone, as those mighty vessels have captured the hearts and minds of people and nations across the world for a long time. Back in the late 19th and early 20th century, the battleship craze was truly a global phenomenon. The age of wood and sails, of muzzle-loaded guns and, and well-timed broadsides had clearly come to an end. Now arose the heavily armed and armored battleships with turreted guns and whose increasingly complex mechanics and design cost a fortune to build and to maintain. But every seafaring nation, everyone who wanted to have a presence on the high seas, needed such a ship. And not just the major powers in Europe. There were naval committees in South America, in Asia, in Australia, lobbying to invest large parts of their nation's budgets into building these steely giants. Of course, everyone was well aware that the main purpose of the battleship was warfare. It was a power factor that was able to dictate the course of battle on the high seas. But at the same time, it represented the ability of a nation to design, build, finance, and, and maintain such a giant. Each commission became a spectacle and was publicly celebrated as a major achievement, a milestone in their national history, and was generally met with an outpouring of patriotic fervor and national sentiment. And by naval tradition, a new ship was to bear a symbolic name, one that not only represented the culture behind it, but also personified the ship's identity. It's also important here to remember that ordinary people played a direct role in the financing and building of such a battleship through donations and labor. And hundreds, if not thousands, of their sons and their brothers would serve on them. So a battleship represented the fate of a society in more ways than one. The Austro-Hungarian battleship Viribis Unitis was to reflect the unique multi-ethnic and polyglot nature of the Habsburg Empire. Commissioned in 1912 through the lobbying of Archduke Franz Ferdinand's naval club, Viribus Unitis was to use the diversity of the empire as a strength and represent all the peoples of the realm through service on the capital ship. However, the extremely strict social hierarchy still remained, since the Germans and the Czechs serving on the ship usually came from industrialized parts of the empire, it was also reflected in their duties. They were the engineers, the specialists with the telegraphs and electronic equipment, as well as manning the main guns. Next in line were the Hungarians, responsible for the secondary guns and the torpedo tubes. The lower decks were the workstations of Croats and Italians. Interestingly enough, despite them actually hailing from coastal provinces, they were generally trusted the least and had to work with stocking, storage, and stuff like that. But the same often went for other minorities like the Romanians, Slovaks, and Ukrainians. From the outside, living and working on a flagship was usually seen as an honor, but living with over a thousand people in a military environment in such a confined space was fairly harsh as well. Discipline was rigid, punishments could be severe, and the flagship of a nation had to be kept spotlessly clean at all times. On the other hand, such massive ships offered many daily customs and routines to keep the men fit and spirits high. Sports were common, but there were also often libraries, gramophone rooms, and even cinemas. A capital ship's mere existence could also have far-reaching consequences when it came to foreign policy. Just the announcement of its development could suddenly enhance a nation's strategic and its diplomatic position in the world. 
every seafaring nation would have to react to either build their own battleship in order to compete or, if they were unable to do so, find other ways to challenge that sudden shift in power. It's a bit crazy to think a single battleship could make or break alliances, but the sea lanes are the world's lifelines. One nation that knew this all too well was, of course, the island nation, Britain. Back in 1915, a full year into the Great War, the British Admiralty made the urgent request for a new battleship, one that was to be based on the sturdy and reliable Queen Elizabeth class, but upgraded with the newest developments in naval warfare, like underwater protection against German torpedoes. Designated HMS Hood, the new capital ship's hull was 60 meters longer than most major vessels at the time and was also much heavier. From HMS Dreadnought to HMS Hood, there was a 130% increase in displacement tonnage. A lot of this weight came from the massive armaments. Outfitted with 8 15-inch guns, 12 5.5-inch guns, and 10 torpedo tubes, its firepower was nothing to laugh at. Yet. Battleships needed to walk a careful balance between the big three. Firepower was one of the three, but only one. The other two were armor and speed. And when it came to speed, Hood was incredibly fast for its time, able to reach 32 knots at top speed thanks to four geared steam turbines. But when it came down to armor, that was Hood's flaw. The Battle of Jutland in 1916 was one of the few actual major naval engagements during the Great War. But it had a much larger impact than many might think. That engagement in the North Sea ended with the loss of three battle cruisers and nearly a fourth, which was a huge shock to the British Admiralty. One that was certainly downplayed and hidden from the public, yes, but shock nevertheless. It was argued that Hood needed to be better protected if she wanted to be more than a battle cruiser. The designers were quick to increase the belt armor to an angled maximum of 305 millimeters thick hardened Krupp cement. But they were never sure that this would be enough. Warships, if they are not lost to battle, are generally built to last for decades of service, right? However, with steady advances in naval technology, there's always the risk that a battleship could be suddenly made obsolete. So sooner or later, the nation had to invest in modernizing even their most advanced capital ships. For example, Boilers and engines needed to be replaced by lighter and more efficient ones. New command and fire control systems were equipped with additions like, like night fighting or, or anti-aircraft facilities. Innovations like damage control systems, emergency flooding and pumping systems were also of concern should the worst case scenario arise. Sometimes a warship even needed major refits like the lengthening of the stern or the reduction of hull resistance, often done in order to compensate for an increase in displacement tonnage. Turrets might also be replaced to allow for a higher elevation of newer guns. HMS Hood was scheduled to be modernized again in 1941, but met her fate in a duel with the mighty German battleship Bismarck in May that same year. Hood was simply incapable of withstanding punishment from an enemy vessel that was armed to the same standard as she was. According to the doctrine of the day, battleships had basically two jobs in battle. Either dominate smaller fleets by their superiority in range, armor, and speed, or slug it out with a ship equal in size and power. You know, fast cruisers and torpedo boats could defend a coastline or home waters quite effectively, but they did not guarantee a place among the world's major players. For example, the Netherlands, though not considered a major force on the continent, still reigned over an overseas colonial empire in the East Indies, right? The Dutch Royal Navy could not go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a major European navy, but by building HNLMS De Zeven Provincien in 1909, they could still dominate the local Asian navies for the time being. The Russo-Japanese War 
provided a stark demonstration that European nations' navies could be overwhelmed. The Japanese were actually in the process of building their own new flagship at the same time the British were building Hood. Battleship building had always been an international process. It was rare that one nation was able to provide everything necessary to complete such an endeavor, be it design, construction expertise, or just a sizable dockyard. In fact, all eight of the earlier Japanese battleships had been built in Britain and mirrored British standards and British equipment. By the time of the Great War, though, Japan's politics were pretty rapidly changing. Still riding high from their victory in the Battle of Tsushima back in 1905, many Japanese naval men in the teens had dreams of grandeur and an empire of their own in the Pacific. And to realize that dream, they needed their own independently made battleship, Nagato, named after one of Japan's ancient samurai clans, was to lead the Imperial Japanese Navy into the future. With a big budget increase, they made sure that both vertical and horizontal armor would guard the length of the ship's magazines and the machinery spaces, with 30 centimeters of segmented armor and layers of high tensile steel plates. It was even tested with a full-scale model in which they detonated 200 kilos of explosives to confirm their calculations. Nagato was supposed to play a major role in the all-deciding battleship-on-battleship clash that would win any future naval war so it had to be as advanced as possible. It was finally completed in 1921, just before the Washington Naval Conference, which set limitations on tonnage and discussed naval disarmament. The anything-goes approach was to be abandoned, since such an arms race not only led nations to the brink of war, but clearly also towards bankruptcy. With some grumbling, the Japanese signed the Washington Naval Treaty, so Nagato remained the main battleship of the Imperial Japanese Navy until the commission of the Yamato in December 1941 during World War II. So much like Hood, Nagato was constantly overhauled and modernized to continue to lead the Navy for those two decades. Faster, stronger, better protected. As long as peace lasted, she served as a typical flagship. Nagato visited foreign nations fired salutes, and became diplomatic ground for politicians to debate the future of the nation, all while waiting to be unleashed for that for which she was built. Yet, ironically, when it did come down to fighting over the future of Japan's influence in the Pacific, the age of the battleship had come to an end. No one in 1920 could really see that one day it would be the aircraft carrier that decided war on the high seas and game-changing battles like Midway, which Sabaton also wrote a song for, would be decided by air power. Throughout the war, battleship Nagato narrowly escaped destruction several times, yet she would survive as Japan's only surviving operable capital ship. In March 1946, Nagato's survivability was tested once more, this time in the Bikini Atoll by two atomic bombs. This time she sank. Even though battleships had been supplanted by carriers and naval air power, post-war they were still a major part of any navy, and they still were, and they still are today, impressive and mighty symbols of the nations that they represent. Okay, battleships. Now, you They're guys, very interesting. They are, but you've been aboard a lot of battleships just because people take you there. Yes, and uh, there are a few around that you can visit. Yeah. And uh, I find them quite interesting. I mean, the, the, the size of them. Yeah. That there's so much to experience. Yeah. You can walk around. I mean... We get to a lot of uh, uh, various uh, uh, museums and, you, you know, you walk around and, okay, here's a tank. Okay, but the tank is relatively small. I yeah, mean, yeah, when you totally. go into it, you're like, okay, there's not much. You see what you see in front of you. And uh, for the aircraft, yeah. it's mostly the same unless they have a huge cargo hold. Um, but 
most of the time you don't see so much interesting. I mean, it's the cockpit where there's a lot of interesting. Yeah. And the rest of the plane is normally it's, not that interesting. Yeah. So, but the thing is, when you get into a battleship, you find a lot of different because they are so huge. Yeah. And uh, you you walk around and like, wow, what is this and what is this and how and does the guns, this work? Especially gigantic to stand next to. You know? Yes. I know we've talked about you were on the battleship Texas, which I had to go to as a child. We mentioned that in one episode. How many different battleships would you say you've been on, if you can't, can remember exactly? Mm, okay. Um, there aren't so many battleships that we have been on. Yeah. I mean, but there are various destroyers. Okay, sure. And submarines. And uh, there is... Uh, I've been aboard at least one carrier. That would be okay. the USS Midway. Wow, cool. San Diego. Yeah. Which I find very interesting as well, because... Yeah. I've be- never been aboard a carrier. I've been aboard battleships. Being a, a, a aboard a carrier is... Wow. Yeah. That, and that was like one of my all time favorite ideas for where a subaton should be, should be on an aircraft carrier. But even when you think like of the, like the World War II era carriers, which were obviously smaller than the ones today, it still hold like 150, 200 planes. You know, that's, a, yeah. that's, a, that's a, They're huge. Yeah. Well, uh, and you can see why that took over from the age of the battleship, although very unwilling to a lot of people. They didn't want to give up their battleships because, like we say, it's, it's the symbol of might and of power. It's got the big guns. Aircraft carriers don't have the big guns. No, nope. so. but they have a lot of uh, planes. They have a lot of planes. That's true. Um, now, as for battleships, do you ever think that maybe in the future battleships will be specifically involved with Sabaton in any way? Ah, I mean, we, we have a lot of songs with it yeah, obviously yeah, sure, yeah. and uh, we have done a lot of stories with that and um, yeah I mean uh, of course I want to bring a battleship to the stage that's what you want to do but uh, they are again they're quite size see I was thinking that might be the limitation would be the, the size we, we managed to bring a tank to the stage yeah but you didn't have to fill the fill the arena with water to bring the tank with the stage oh True. you would do a battleship not in water if you did a battleship oh yeah I, I haven't really fully figured out how we're going to get a battleship in there, but i really like to do it. That would be... I'm trying to picture it in my head. I'm trying to figure out how remarkable that would be to have a battleship. The tank works pretty good. Yeah, you know, it does. That's... And, uh, and, and we brought a couple of other uh, things onto the stage over the years as well. So, and uh, Whose idea was the tank? Uh, I think the whole idea started with me saying in an interview that uh, we're going to bring a tank onto the stage. Okay. <laughs> and people held me to that. Yeah, that's... Uh, and eventually we had to do it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, uh, when we had uh, uh, Hannes, when he joined the band, I asked him for the size of his drum kit. And he's like, why? Because I'm building a drum riser for you. And he's like, oh, it's like that and that and that. Okay, thank you. And he's like, how is the <laughs> drum riser going to look like? You wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say when he first saw it? He said, wow. Yeah. I think everybody said that when they first saw it. Can we get some photos? And there's Hannes. Look at that. That's beautiful. <laughs> well, now, it's obviously, I'm wearing this because I'm a sailor today and stuff. And the same with the hat. What is the, tell me, what's the story behind that hat? Okay, so this obviously belongs to uh, uh, one of the crew members of the tour. Okay. Who was obviously? Uh, uh, I obviously not obviously, but <laughs> okay. for the people who came to the tour to end all tours and yeah. they watched the song Dreadnought, yeah. there was a sailor showing up and looking out. And if you, uh, we had on the video screen behind us what he was looking at, you know, yeah. in the binoculars, we we wanted this to be, you know, presented in the crowd as well. Sure. But uh, in front of the tour, we couldn't produce enough of them okay. to, to hand them out on the oh, tour. Oh, to just give them out? That'd be awesome. We, we would have done it, yeah. but uh, we couldn't do it. Uh, we did the masks for Attack of the Dead Men. Yeah, that's cool. And, yeah. and uh, it would have been cool to see the whole audience like sailors, but maybe that happens some other time. Yeah, I, I think they're really cool hats. I'd love to see a whole Sabaton audience in those, you know? And... Um, that was made me think when you're talking about the video. When you did the video for Bismarck, I know we talked about about the filming of that. What sh- what did you actually film that on? Uh, I forgot. I can't remember. It was on a fishing boat. Okay, it was on a fishing yeah. boat. Yeah. So uh, a, a very cold one. It was. Super, yeah, I remember super that part. Freezing. I remember that it was cool. And uh, uh, it had not so much uh, space to go inside and get warm. Right. 
So we were quite free. But that was, that was in Southern Europe, wasn't it? Wasn't it near Turkey? It, it, it was in Turkey. Okay. And, um, but uh, it doesn't matter because it was, it was still super cold. Cold. <laughs> cold is cold, wherever you're cold. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, was, yeah. Was, was Tommy even cold? Of course. Because Tommy's usually never cold. I mean, he, in France, he was wearing just that corduroy thing. It's like two degrees, you know, but yeah, he's but the ice wolf from the north. He, he was also cold. I promise okay. you that. Sorry, Tommy. <laughs> Sorry, Tommy, to make fun of your ability to withstand the cold. Um, well, that seems to be about it for today, right? Yep. So say goodbye to everybody. Goodbye, everybody. And thanks for watching. See you next time on Sabaton History. Thanks for watching. That was awesome, right? So please subscribe to our channel and click that little bell so you get notifications the next time we release another episode of Sabaton History Channel.